Welcome to Murder with Friends, the show where friends get together and talk about the darker sides of history. I'm your host, Grace Baldridge, and you're joining us on another Campfire Edition. The theme for this series is the crimes of lifetime. So the way it's gonna work is we've each uh, discussed these cases and they all fit the theme of crimes that have been covered and adapted into lifetime original movies. But what is a lifetime original movie? Christine, how would you describe a lifetime original movie for someone who wasn't familiar? I would say that a lifetime original movie is usually a murder or crime that's been ripped from the headlines and then they take it and they like make it into a melodrama, a human melodrama and they sensationalize it a lot. So it's gonna be a little over the top. It's gonna definitely highlight like sex and love and anything that's, you know, on like the darker sides, they're gonna highlight that definitely. And they certainly did that with the case that we're gonna be discussing today. It's the case of the Craigslist killer. This is Philip Markoff who went on a violent spree in 2009, in the spring of 2009. It started uh, with him going on Craigslist and uh, soliciting sex workers for whatever, and uh, one of them actually ended in the murder of Jalissa Brisman on April 14th, 2009. This was just four days after his initial attack on Trisha Leffler, who was an escort. There's a lot to get into here. Much would be made of Philip as a wholesome, all-American medical student, uh, and that's certainly what they played up in the Lifetime movie. So what do you guys know about this case? What can we talk about? Well, in this case, it's kind of like they really highlight the fact that he was a medical student, that he was engaged, and he didn't fit the typical like framework for what you would consider a killer. And I feel like a lot of that was like so highlighted in this movie. It's like, yeah. he's so social, he's a fiance. But, yeah. no, but see, Christine, that's where I thought they got it right because when we think of serial killers like Manson or or people that have been like <laughs> over the top, mm -hmm. Richard Ramirez, they, had, they fit a type of framework in, in that sense. Lifetime, this was a perfect storm for Lifetime because one, you had someone who came from an okay family. He wasn't uh, from the streets, if you will. And so it was, and he was accomplished. So it, it, that, it fits in that whole, that um, pretty people kind of box that Lifetime loves to do these movies on because you have one or two yeah. movies, you have the really like violent, uh, uh, depictions, and you have the, oh, we're getting married, and then behind closed doors, I'm this monster. It's sort of like the killer you know. Exactly. You know the what guy I mean? Next where door. it's not this Absolutely. other thing. You know, we talked about Richard Ramirez, where yeah. when he uh, was caught, the big reason, I think, in part why he his face was just so everywhere in the media was because he was so other and scary. And he right. came yeah. from the shadow. And this then guy. Philip Markoff, who was really, I would, you know, qualify him as like a spree killer, because yeah. Yeah. when you think of, when you hear the name the Craigslist killer, at least it was my notion before researching the case that this had been spread out over perhaps months. Yeah. But this really was condensed into about just a seven day period, Crazy. six, yeah, six seven days, yeah. um, where he seems to have snapped, even though it, it also appears that he'd been really looking into uh, sex work and exploring what he could get access to on Craigslist, through Craigslist, through the internet. Um, but it was this really short period of time that he actually went and did something about it, which was really horrible and really scary, but it wasn't this big rampage um, that I, I think it, you think of when you hear of the Craigslist killer. But I maybe could have spent longer if he had not been so bad at it. Right. Yeah. You know he what was, I mean? He was horrible. He was kind he of vanilla. Just, very, yeah. very vanilla. It was like the Zodiac killer. Yeah, for, he was very vanilla. For being like as educated as he was, he didn't really put in a lot of thought into covering up his tracks. Yeah. Well, don't you think that murders? that's part of why he was spinning out so much, you know what I mean? Because yeah. he uh, obviously, it, it must have been this spur of the moment sort of thing because he wasn't even thinking about security cameras. I think whenever there is security footage of a crime or of someone leaving a crime, I know that it's gonna get more picked yeah. up than a case that doesn't have that yeah. because security footage is so eerie. And you have all the footage of him leaving these hotels with his hat on and it's just creepy as all get out. Even if there's, it's just him walking down the hallway. Yeah. But yeah. because you know that we feel like we're peering in on this awful moment that's about to happen or just took place, I knew that this was gonna get totally picked up. Um, I, I think that there's a, there's a lot to get into about um, sort of toxic masculinity and how a lot right. of what yeah. his sexual desires were, he felt like he couldn't articulate them, so he went about it in a very private way. Um, would you guys agree with that? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Because, I mean, he had a bunch of different email addresses. One of them was sexaddict 
5385. And then Christine, you mentioned that he had another email address that was also. It was like sex addict 5385. And for that one, he, he like he had pictures of his torso, but he was also looking for transgender and, and, and cross-dressing um, partners with that account. Yeah, and, and by all accounts, he was a very conservative person. Yeah. Uh, he was a member of Young Republicans, which I'm just saying that. <laughs> And you can interpret that for what you want, <laughs> okay? I'm just that's just a fact that he was, uh, and I think that there was a certain level of shame that he experienced when he realized that he had these uh, sexual Bridges. desires. Yeah. And we were saying before the show, this could have gone the way of like Fifty Shades of Grey, which is I still think like yeah. I hate I don't like that franchise, but um, it could he could have just had like this a healthy sexual appetite that was perhaps a little deviant from whatever we imagine to be healthy, sexual, normal behavior, whatever that means. But it didn't go that way because I think there was all this internalized shame yeah. that eventually became uh, very violent yeah. and really yeah. Plus, dark. It just seems like he was under a lot of pressure from the wedding and everything. His fiance was planning this wedding. I keep, when I keep like reading about that, I feel like that was a big catalyst to like why all of this just like kind of came out all at once. He met Megan McCaskill a while ago and then they- they McAllister? McAllister? I think so, yeah. Okay, so they, they met and from the outside, it looked like they have a, they had a wonderful relationship. Like he met her family, everything was good. He was still going to school and to med school to finish that up while she was at home in Boston kind of getting ready for this wedding. Mm -hmm. And like in the movie and everything, it just shows like, oh, he's so supportive. He's listening to her. He's agreeing with all these different wedding decisions that they have. But he was deeply, I mean, unhappy on the inside. Yeah, and secretive. Yeah, but didn't see what I took from the movie. I agree with you, Amir. But what I took from the movie was that he always had, I got a more sinister kind of dude from the movie. That he, yeah, he loved Megan, but I always felt that he had, he was playing her too. Kind of, it just seemed like he would appease her conversations. Like, well, he well, also had the, the gambling addiction that we right, see. Right. He lies about the money, and so he's kind of leaving, leading a double life. Also, a fractured that, uh, yeah. family life with his own uh, immediate family was. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you guys, let, let's just toss to the trailer now, okay. so we can show you the treatment just in trailer form of the Craigslist killer, Philip Markoff, and then we're gonna come back and talk about what you guys felt about the depiction. So let's take a look. Yes! <laughs> My best friend's wedding. With me, what you see is pretty much what you get. Police say the warning is out to women now that this man is still on the loose. They're worried he's planning his next attack. Calm, attractive, psycho who likes to rough up defenseless women. Couldn't ask for a better cut. Where have you been? <laughs> so be careful what you search so be for. Be careful. All right, Amir, you really liked this movie. I, I really did not. I liked it. Convince it me. just it really affected me cuz they they went full blown with the whole let's do the romance for the first 45 minutes of the movie before everything falls apart. So like I don't know, it really tugged at my heartstrings and like I was very affected by it. I just I got to a point where like I just cringed at every scene between him and his fiance. It was hard to watch. Oh, well, you I'm guys sorry. go. I mean, yeah, jump me, in. The moment, the moment he says like young Republican, I'm like, okay, bye. I'm just kind of like, I want to see how this guy treats his servers, and then we can decide if he was a psycho beforehand. <laughs> okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like ten percent tipper for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, you guys are wow. The shades real. I when I so again Lifetime. Lifetime. When this movie came out, Lifetime was building their network as Lifetime. Time, television for women. So as 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 you see, he's sexy as hell. She's attractive. It's very glossy. It's very um, the the melodrama, as you mentioned in one of yeah. the other episodes, is spot on. I liken this movie to a more uh, wider version of Enough from Jennifer Lopez and um, from Jennifer Lopez and her the way her and her husband were in love at first. It's all blissful, and then all of a sudden he he veers left and slaps her across the face. I, I mean, it, that's, he doesn't do that though in this. Like he keeps right. his like. 
she is like this one side of his life that like he wants to keep pure and okay. He's a virgin right. whore complex, yeah. it seems but, like. Yeah, I agree with you, Amir, though. But what I'm saying is back to him, he, he this is typical, this is textbook. He has a double life, he comes from a great pedigree. He has all the elements in a row to make you think like this guy can't be that guy. And then Lifetime really enjoyed flipping us on our head and be like, all right, so let's get into why he's effed up. And then I do think that he was kind of a, a, a wussy killer, if you will, only for simple fact that when you see that, when you see the trailer, the Craigslist killer, you think it's gonna be more sinister than it really is. Yeah. And yeah. what was disappointing about the movie was that he wasn't powerful. I guess I, I'm used to seeing characters like him really asserting their power and really having a dynamic and compelling. Well, thank well, I God he wasn't yeah. though, no, he right, but we're more victims. Of course, and we're, but we're talking in the context of, okay. of how Lifetime treated the story. Yeah. Um, because I guess they were as factual as they could have been. I, I don't know, I, it wasn't one of my favorites. Yeah. I thought that the storytelling in this movie specifically was so irresponsible for the simple fact of the matter that they did spend the first That's true. development of the movie so that you sympathize with this couple and this guy that you know, oh well, he wants to be good. It's this love story. It's practically like the notebook for the beginning of the yeah. movie. And yeah, that's well and good. And that's a that's a tragic part of this as well. Megan McAllister's life absolutely fell apart. She stood by her fiance for a long time. She asserted his innocence. He asserted his own innocence at his arraignment, um, and so he sad, would actually man. never go to trial because uh, in August 15th of 2010, just before trial, he committed suicide. Um, so a lot of this evidence that would have come out, there's still a lot that we don't know. And part of me wonders if perhaps he never wanted that to see the light of day and that's why he committed suicide. He tried before, it's a, it's a really sad part of the story and I we definitely need to get into that. But as far as the storytelling in this Lifetime movie, I'm like, you don't try and make me feel bad for this guy yeah. Yeah. that went out and hunted women. Like, so I don't, you, you I don't. felt like they were trying to make you feel bad for this guy? Uh, well, I think part of it was, I don't know necessarily in the writing, but I think part of it was that the actor was very charming, and yeah. he was played by Jake McDorman, who has also been an Aquamarine, Greek, and Limitless, because yeah. they made a show out of that Bradley Cooper movie. Um, oh, that's weird. yeah, they did. Uh, <laughs> and um, basically, I think that he was—he's a very charismatic actor, and he took on this role very well. He is significantly yeah. more attractive yeah. than the actual yeah. Philip Mark. I got a lot of Patrick Bateman vibes from his performance, and I think that that's what he was tapping into. Yeah. But I don't think that this story is a Patrick Bateman story. Right. You you know, and I think that, so I understand when it comes to the acting of it, um, why as an actor you want to create this character, but this was a lived experience for people. Yeah. And I felt that the way that they went about this, I just, I, I don't feel bad for this they guy. They humanize him a little too much. A little too much. Kind of like, yeah. but, do you, but do you think that is because Lifetime has a history of doing that when they're doing biopics, when they're doing stories, because they're viewing audience. You know, in 2018, had this come out now, it would have been a whole different tone because of things that have transpired yeah. with the Me Too and Time's Up. So I think back then, Lifetime was banking on, okay, we have to find, they want viewers, we want eyeballs, eyeballs on it. What's the best way to get that? And again, Lifetime was, Television for women. Yeah, and you make, you can also sort of make the argument where it's like, what would you do if your fiance, who's only treated you well, but is accused of these awful things? The fact of the matter is that if he's carrying out this double life, he didn't love her. Like I'm, there, yeah. you just right. you can't splice that. It kind of reminds me of what we talked about on Pop Trigger with Uma Thurman. We have sure. to stop equating cruelty with love. They're not. They're separate entities. Yeah. And he was a very cruel person that did yeah. awful things. So for them to then juxtapose it with like, but then this love, I'm like, I agree. No. I'll go out on a limb and stop. say. He was a sociopath. For and sure. He had no conscience and he had no I care for I agree people. with you, and I think that it is illuminated. Uh, well, I mean, I don't want to speculate because we don't know that for, for certain, but I see where you're coming from, and I think that that was absolutely uh, illustrated in how he committed suicide. Right. Also, yeah. so let's he, talk oh, about that. Just, well, just to touch on your point about him being a sociopath, I mean, in one of the scenes in the movie, he grabs, uh, he assaults a girl. And then his colleague, yeah, and then pulls her aside like, "Hey, come here," and then tells her like, "Keep your mouth shut, or I'm gonna, or I know where you live. It's, but this yeah. will go down." Yeah. So for sure, he was a sociopath, or from what we've seen, well, he's been depicted as. Yeah, I mean, and just the ego behind it too, where he's just brazenly walking away from his crimes. Um, yeah. He kills himself, like I said, August fifteenth, two thousand and ten, just before trial. And the way that he does it is uh, pretty gruesome and incredibly manipulative uh, to his fiance just before he goes. So what happens here? Yeah, so he fashioned like a shiv from 
I think what they're saying now is a jail pen. Mm -hmm. So he made like a knife from that. And he basically slashed all of his arteries in his legs, in his arms, and in his throat, and then put pa toilet paper in his, in his throat, and then a bag over himself, and then a blanket over himself. And then he had also uh, spread out a number of photos of him and his fiance. And in blood wrote a message to his fiance. On yeah, the in wrote blood name, he yeah. wrote her name and their pet name. Uh, also, but there was another message pet. that only she could see, I guess, if from what, it's, what it says. Yeah. What it says that, that they really, that I don't know what it said, but he wrote something else as well. So before we were going to taping today, Amir mentioned like, how the hell is this woman Ever gonna be ever okay? Gonna be okay. okay. Ever. Yeah. How are you gonna trust someone ever again when yeah. that's your relationship? It's tragic, and he's he is an awful bad person, and uh, I don't like right to the last second. Right to the last second, yep. and I don't like that you watch this Lifetime movie, and even in that scene of him uh, killing himself, the music and everything, it yeah. makes you feel bad for him. And look, it's tragic. It's it's awful what happened. The events are awful and it, that him taking his life is he never was able to face responsibility, accountability and justice yeah. for what he did. It's it's all bad. And lifetime, you can't play a sad violin and try and manipulate our emotions. Damn it. But that was the correct The skill. I just wanted to touch on the suicide really pisses me off and I feel like in our in like our prison systems like we let it happen far too often. Mm -hmm. And that's such a cop out for these people that do horrible crimes. Like they need to face life behind bars, and like and, re and rehabilitation. That's why I don't like, like even facilities. if there isn't rehabilitation, that's the whole point, right? Like there needs to be punitive measures. And someone who ends up killing himself after he'd already tried twice, it's it's unacceptable yeah. for us to allow that to happen. For right. me, the other thing. This is another discussion, but it's just like we have to remember that. The place where you have people with the most mental illness are in Rikers Island and Los yeah. Angeles prison. It's, it's, it's a bigger conversation about mental health in America, I think, that needs to be discussed more. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. but, but, how, but yeah. how would we, like, Mary, you make a good point. How, but how would we facilitate that kind of, like, if he, I mean, I think, yeah, if you, you're right. The reason why he's in jail is because he needs to be punished. Um, but, you know, do you think that's, how would we facilitate? Him more people not killing themselves. Like I, I guess yeah. that it's it's, so many it's hard because then the authorities they argue like if someone really wants to kill themselves they will figure it out yeah. over time. They're gonna figure out how to do it, and I, I get that. I just it it angers me that this guy never was served justice. Right. And no, he, got, he I, got to escape it. Yeah. No, I, I completely echo that. Um, there's so much to get into with this conversation. So we want to hear from you guys now in the conversation. In the comment section below, had you watched the Craigslist Killer movie? <laughs> Did you like it? Did you hate it? What do you think about uh, Philip Markoff and his case and the justice system? So much. Let us know. We'll see you next time on Murder with Friends.